Bibles this morning. Go ahead and turn to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. As we continue in our series in the book of John. I was going to skip it, but John chapter 2, it's a message I've preached from time to time, preach often. Most of you have heard it. And uh, just from hearing it so often, or maybe hearing it before, I thought, I'll just skip it. And then, uh, and just go on to something else. But I thought, but you know what's good? Sometimes when it's just good, it's good. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like enchiladas. They're good. You just don't go one time. I mean, that's why you go to a buffet. And uh, you can go back again and again and again. And um, I think it, there's, there's really something to learn. Um, oftentimes... I just sometimes feel like God lays it out that way, though I don't intentionally do it. If you hear it again, and then you hear it again, you hear it again. Couldn't be you just needed to hear it again. It was funny, Johnny Pope came two years ago, or two Bible conferences ago, and he preached the suburbs of forgiveness, which is a message he preaches quite often. And I love the message. And he came back the very next year, and he preached the suburbs of forgiveness. And I know as soon as he started, I knew where he was going. I thought, man, he didn't stop think that he preached this last year. And I'm, I'm sitting out in the pew listening to him preach the suburbs of forgiveness. And he preached, you know, and the whole time I'm going, I've heard this. And about 30 minutes into it, I said, man, I need to hear this again. And, um, and I've just kind of figured out I was more convicted hearing it the second time than I was the first time. So, having said that, if we get into this and you say, Brother Mark, I've heard this. I've heard you do this. I've seen you turn water into wine. It's a trick. I know how you do it. Doesn't matter. And by the way, I don't have any props up here. But I've already heard this. I'd ask you this morning, just kind of open your heart, because maybe you need to hear it again. Amen? Maybe there's just something we just need to hear again. John chapter 2. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Isn't that good when somebody says, come eat? I like that. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And his mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone. And here's what so many people miss. Now let me just put this in there, and I'm probably going to mention it again. This is key when you study Scripture. And I mean, Hollywood, the movies miss it, preachers miss it, teachers miss it. This is really key to understanding this miracle is this next verse, this part. And there were set there six water pots of stone, and it tells you what those water pots of stone were there for. It tells you what they were there for. After the manner of the purifying of the Jews. Now, I'll tell you what that is here. And matter of fact, there's verses in Scripture that tell us what that water was there for. We'll get into that here in a minute. But it's key, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they fill them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was. 
The servants which drew the water knew. The servants who drew that water knew what kind of water that was. We'll get into that here in a minute. The governor of feasts called the bridegroom. And saith unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when man hath well drunk, then that which is worse, that thou hast kept the good wine until now. I want to preach to you a message, water into wine. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you this morning. Thank you again for the opportunity to preach this morning. Lord, a familiar message. Lord, help me, use me, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Cleanse me of sin, free me of self. Fill me with the Spirit, Lord. Help me to preach lovingly yet boldly. Even now, Lord Jesus, fill this place. Lord, come amongst us, meet with us, abide with us. We ask this in your precious and holy name. Amen. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He is at or around or about 30 years old. He would live to be 33 and a half. For three and a half years, he would, if you will, carry on or carry out his ministry. This is at the beginning of his ministry as he begins now to go from town to town. But as of yet, he has not performed a miracle. And not only has he not performed a miracle, as yet he has not really done anything that the angel predicted or prophesied that Jesus would do. What do I mean by that? The angel, when he appeared to Mary, told Mary that she was going to conceive of the Holy Spirit. She was going to conceive that God would, would uh, or the Holy Spirit would conceive in her. She would bear a child and that she would call his name Jesus. And you might remember that story. The angel appears to Mary, tells her these things. Mary is just nothing more than a teenage girl. But in that speech, if you will, that the angel gives to Mary, the angel tells her a few things about the child that she is going to bear. And I found it very interesting. And you might, you got to kind of stop and think about Mary as she's listening to the angel tell her these things. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 31 it says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great. Now stop and think about that. He shall be great. He shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now that's what was told to Mary. The book of Isaiah and, and the children of Israel, they were studiers of the prophets. Isaiah had said this, that for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government would be upon his shoulder. His name should be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. See, what we don't understand, sometimes we miss this historical element. We know that the Romans were there, that they were in rule, and that they were governing upon the time of Jesus' crucifixion. But you have to understand, they were in rule, and they were in government, and they were ruling during the time of his birth. Remember, a decree went out that all the world should be taxed. So Jesus is now 30 years old, and the children of Israel are still under Roman rule. Now these changed. The Romans were cruel people, and they were taxing the people, and they were uh, uh, harsh to the people. The days of David had ended, but Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus, remembered that an angel appeared to her and said, your son, your son will one day sit on the throne of David and there will be no end to his kingdom. One day, 
He's going to be great. One day, he's going to be mighty. One day, he's going to rule with an iron hand. One day, the world will bow down to your sight. And as they gathered together at this wedding, they come together and, and the Bible says that they asked for wine and Mary said they have no wine. And Jesus looked at Mary and said, Mother, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. That's always fascinated me. And again, it's something people miss. It's something I've heard pastors preach this, this, at least this passage of Scripture over and over again. And it just seems they just skip over that. They miss it. They asked for wine. Is there any wine? Can we have some wine? Mary says, I, uh, they have no wine. And Jesus says, Mother, mine hour is not yet come. What does mine hour is not yet come have anything to do with wine? Absolutely nothing. If we were to go back again and look at that story of Mary and she gives birth to Jesus and after she hears what the angel says to her and she gives birth to Jesus, she makes this statement or, or the statement is made that Mary took everything in, heard everything the angel said and the Bible says that Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. You know what that means? That means she didn't tell nobody. It means that she didn't go through life and go to family reunions and go, hey, let me tell you what the angel told me about my boy. She pondered all these things in her heart. And after 30 years, they're sitting there at a wedding and Jesus is now comes walking in and all of these disciples and he comes in and he has his entourage and she looks at this man that she gave birth to 30 years ago. Amen. Don't you just look at your children sometime and go, man, I remember when you were, you know. And, and, and Mary looks at her son. that He's been out of the house and out on his own and he comes in and he has a following and he's teaching and, and, and he's, he's grown up. He's not a kid anymore. And Mary looks at Jesus and Jesus says, Mary, have any wine? Mary says, we're out of wine. But then Jesus looks at Mary and says, Mom, Mine hour has not yet come. Mary turns and looks at the servant and says, Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Why would she say that? Because Jesus didn't answer her question about wine. Jesus answered what was in her heart. Mary was screaming, when are you going to become what the angel promised me you'd become? When are you going to be great? When are you going to reign? When are you going to sit on the throne of David? When are you going to whoop some Romans? That's what their heart was screaming. That's what everybody's heart was screaming. But Jesus said, Mary, can you imagine? We have no wine, Mom. It's not my time yet. I can't imagine the facial expression on Mary's face when Jesus answered what her heart was screaming. Wow. Yeah, if you can read my heart, it's coming. Everything that angel said is coming. And then, then she turns and serves and says, Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Now you better do it. Jesus looks at the servants and says, go over to the purification pots. And for the sake of time, I, I'm not going to get too much into it tonight as far, or, or this morning as far as turning there. But in Matthew chapter 15, verse 2, Luke 11, 39, Mark 7, 3 through 4, uh, talks about 
what the purification parts were or, or in the mannerism of purification pots. Purification pots were simply where you washed your hands. Y'all still don't get it. You will here in a minute. It's where before you went into any kind of a banquet hall or, or, or there was a gathering of people in that, in that day and age and time, it was kosher, amen? I don't know about y'all's house, but you don't sit at the table at Charlotte's house till you wash your hands. You take your shoes off when you come in the door, you sit down to eat, you wash your hands. I mean, you walk outside the house, air touched your hands. Go wash your hands. Go, wa go wash. You, you're, you're outside working, you're sweaty. Go bathe. Don't sit down at the table without washing your hands. They, they didn't have modern uh, uh, um, conveniences back then. They would walk. They would wear sandals. They would ride donkeys. They would handle sheep. They would handle animals. And so before they came into any kind of a banquet hall or a wedding, in this case, they had purification pots. You washed your feet. Stay with me. You washed your feet. You washed your hands. And, and it was also for plates. A lot of times they would, and I, I, had, I thought I had to think about this. It's not like going down the road here to a restaurant where they lay plates out. You brought your own plate. They didn't have a whole cabinet full of plates like you guys have at home. They carried their plates. The disciples were traveling. They carried their own stuff. And after they ate off of it, what would they do? The dishes. They'd clean it off. This is a seven-day feast. There's a lot of feet washing going on. There's a lot of hand washing going on. There's a lot of dishes going on. These are the purification pots. It was dirty, mucky, nasty, disgusting water. Jesus tells the servant, go fill them up to the brim. In other words, no tricks. Just so you know, there's no tricks. Now that doesn't mean they said empty them. Empty them, take them out there, wash them out, put a little bleach in it, a little sanitizer, scrub them really good, rinse them out, double wash them, make sure they get heated up, dry them, let them air out, then fill them up again. That's not what happened. Jesus said just fill them up to the brim. By the way, clean water on top of dirty water is still dirty water. Jesus told the servants, go dip down. You've got to read Scripture, folks. He didn't say skim off the top. He said, down. I've got to be careful. I'll lean over. I'll fall off. I'll be going down. Dip down. Go down the pot. Come up. Get a full pitcher of water. Purification water. Feet water. Anybody want to drink feet water? Jesus told the servant, go serve the guy who's running this party feet water. Can you, can you imagine the look on the servant's face? Mary, they looked at Mary and said, Mary! He said, do what he tells you to do. You've got to have some real confidence that your son is who he says he is before you go dip down into feet water and go serve it to somebody. And the servants go and they take it to the cabin. I can imagine the servants would keep turning going, we're getting fired. I got to go serve feet water to the guy who's the governor, the guy who's running the party. And they take it. <laughs> you may turn and go, I don't want to do this. Don't do it. I, I hope there's rewind in heaven. Because did you ever go out to lunch with somebody when you were kids and somebody get up and go to the bathroom? And you like pour salt in their Coke or something? Don't act like y'all didn't do that. Don't, didn't you ever sabotage your buddy's soda or drink or, or a hot fudge sundae? Or something? Well, people I ran around with, you don't go to the bathroom because you leave. Your, something's going to happen to your food. And somebody would get up, we'd sabotage it. And then they'd come back and we're just sitting there just <laughs> laughing. I can't, 
I can't prove it, but it's almost as if Jesus is sitting there and maybe he elbows Peter and goes, watch this. Maybe he leans over after, after having that conversation with Mary. Maybe he just kind of looks across the table and says, Mary, winks at her. Watch this. I was kidding, and, and I was kidding, and I, I know you saw this. We went across the Louisiana border, and uh, uh, they make iced tea out of swamp water there. I swear they do. It's bad. It is dirty water. I couldn't drink it, and Dad drank it down. I said, I guess you just got to get used to drinking swamp water out in Louisiana. But I was, I was giving some of my friends a hard time because I know I, I post it because I know like Sean Druitt and a couple other guys, I live there in Louisiana. I didn't even stop thinking about you. I wasn't being mean or ugly. I just, just nasty water. But I can see Jesus just kind of winking and elbowing and watch. And he took the water and the servant goes and goes to pour the water. And it's dirty, swampy, nasty foot water. And he goes to pour it. And I imagine the servant just kind of turns around and says, I don't want to do this. And Jesus maybe nods because it'll be okay. Do it. No. No, do it. Really, do it. Do it. He didn't say that. He wouldn't yell at him. But some, and I've never understood this, and there's no scriptural basis. But don't you know that that now what? There's some good. I just thought about this. Don't you know that there's good teaching that the servant had to have some faith? There's good teaching there. That servant had to have a little faith in what he's being told to do. And he went, and he poured that water. Now watch, on me. And he pours that water. And somewhere between the pitcher and the cup, it turned into wine. And the governor, not thinking anything of it, he takes a drink of it. Now watch. We often miss this too. He said, more often times than not, the best is served first. He said, but you've saved the best for last. Now we read that and we go, okay, no, that's not possible. Because wine is freshly squeezed grape juice. Grape juice left out in a Mediterranean type environment after three days ferments. And what he's saying is, is everything you squeezed three days ago somehow hasn't fermented. Y'all ever leave a can of peaches out on the cabinet? And go back and, and eat them three days later? And oh, you should try it sometime. You, you get a can of peaches and there's peach juice, and you leave that can of peach juice out, it starts to bubble. And it gets fizzy. And when you eat it, the peaches get fizzy and the juice gets fizzy. It's fermented. And what the governor was saying was, was that how you save the best. How did you do all this work? How did you squeeze all these fresh, freshly squeezed grape juice? It's fresh. It's as if, this, is, this tastes like the stuff you served three days ago. It's fresh. How, how do you serve fresh, new grape juice three days into a party? Because all things become new when Jesus touches them. Hey. And everybody's perplexed. And you know, the Bible doesn't get into it, but don't you think Mary went, oh, hubba hubba, here we go. And it does. And then his ministry begins to pick up from there. And he begins to perform miracles. And his ministry then begins to kick in. But Mary said, we have no wine. Jesus said, mother, my hour has not yet come. Now here it comes. I need to spend the last of the ten minutes talking to you about the hour that had not yet come. 
Because Jesus tells us exactly, and by the way, not a miracle Jesus performed anywhere in Scripture did he just do it on a whim. He always did it to teach somebody something. Always teach us something. Teach his disciples something. He said, my hour has not yet come. Son, when are you, you going to start leading? When are you going to start ruling? When are you going to start doing everything that the angel said you were going to do? When's it going to happen? Mine hour has not yet come. Anywhere in Scripture you, 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 you Google or cross-reference that, that phrase, mine hour, the hour, the hour that Jesus would, would, would go to the cross is what it's going to come back to. The time, Jesus, listen, Mary said, we have no wine. They wanted wine. Can you get us wine? We have no wine. Jesus said, mine hour, the time that I am going to be crucified is not here yet. Mine hour has not yet come. The time that, that, that I'm going to shed my blood for all of humanity. It's not, it's not time yet, Mom. It's not, it's not time for me to take my place. And by the way, they didn't understand it, and the disciples didn't understand it, and they didn't understand it until he rose again. That the time that Jesus would reign, what the prophet was talking about and what the angel was talking about was the time when Jesus comes back to this earth and sets up his kingdom on David's throne that it would never end. That has not happened yet, but it's coming. It could be today, the way this world's going. There's still part, it's still going to happen. And by the way, that doesn't mean that he's still not king of kings and lord of lords. Amen. It's all going to happen. But the hour that, that Jesus is saying, the hour that I'm going to shed my blood, it's not time yet. But, just to show you, Mary, just to show my disciples, and watch, just to show us today that it's going to happen. Let, let, me, let me give you a picture. Let me perform a miracle that will paint a picture for that hour. Now stop and consider from it very quickly the Lord's Supper. We drink what is grape juice, or in the Bible calls it wine, which is simply juice from the vine. We drink a grape juice. It's symbolic of his blood. The wine that was poured was symbolic of the blood that Jesus was going to shed on Calvary. And I knew that right off as I'm looking at this miracle and I'm beginning to study him cross-reference and think well the wine is symbolic of his blood but then I started moving backwards did you stop to think that how many purification pots there were there's six six is the number of man did you stop to think and consider of how dirty and filthy that water was and I began to th stop and consider and think that as filthy and as dirty and as nasty as that water was, it was purification pots for cleanliness. Oh, y'all watch this. Let me show you something. Book of 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us. You know what cleansing means? It means purification. Cleanseth us from all sin. Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Revelation 1, 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. You know what those words all mean? They mean purification. It means that as a man, as a human being, my sin was so vile and so dirty and so filthy and so disgusting and you think it can't be, you can't drink that water, you can't consume that water, 
Nobody would dare even touch that water other than just wash and tear it off as nasty and as filthy as his watch. Only Jesus can take the nastiest, filthiest, vilest water and turn it into not old wine, but sweet, new, brand new, freshly squeezed wine. And only Jesus can take a sinner and wash him white as snow, purified, clean. How often do you Google it? The wedding at Cana, I've heard it. I've heard pastors on social media, and I've heard pastors, pastors preach this. Jesus turned water into wine to keep the party going. Oh, how little you understand Scripture. None of this is about a party. None of this is about self. Everything Jesus did was trying to teach his disciples and teach us something and get us ready. Or in this, in, this, in this period anyway, trying to get his disciples ready for that hour. And moving forward, it's to teach us to look back to that hour and understand that everything Christ did, he did for us. There is but one name under heaven by which we must be saved. The wedding at Canaan, the purification pots, the reading of Mary's heart, everything that was involved in that miracle was not to keep the party going, but it was to show and paint a picture of that hour that was to come where Christ would shed his blood on Calvary's cross to save a sinful world, to save a sinner like me. And the picture he painted was dirty, vile, watch, purification water. And turn that purification water into sweet, freshly squeezed new wine. All, you can look through that any portion of scripture you want. Squeezed wine is a picture of his blood. Dirty, filthy water is a picture of sin. Number six, pitcher man. And who's doing it? Jesus is doing it. By no other name. By no other name. Heads bowed, standing to your feet this morning. Heads bowed, eyes closed.